Brothers and sisters, this is the day that the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it and prepare our hearts and our minds for the worship of God.
Let us worship God. Lent calls us to journey along the edge, to anticipate that final trip to Jerusalem. Lent calls us to the cutting edge, when the wheat falls to the ground and new life comes forth, the cutting of a new covenant. Lent calls us not only to give up false control, but also to take upon ourselves the intention of true participation in the mystery of God with us. For Jesus said, whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, there will my servant be also. The Lord be with you. Holy God, by the cross and resurrection of Jesus, you lift the suffering world toward hope and transformation and open the way to your new covenant. As we move ever closer to the passion of Christ, may your law of love be written on our hearts as he draws all people to himself, revealing your unending, saving love for the world. Amen. Let us pray for the cleansing of our hearts, confessing our sins to the one whose mercy is everlasting. The Lord be with you. O oh Lord of creation, we know that unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains a single grain. We want to sprout, to grow, to produce an abundant harvest for you. Yet we are afraid to fall from our comfort, our illusions of control, and our privilege to yield to the transformation you offer. Forgive our fear and lead us in your ways that we might bear good fruit and tend your harvest of justice, kindness, mercy, and love as we follow Jesus Christ and embody his grace for the sake of the world he came to save. Amen.
there's nothing we can do to make God love us any more, and there's nothing we can do to make God love us any less. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Since God in Christ has forgiven us, let us also forgive one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Good morning and welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church. We're so glad you're here. If you are visiting with us, we hope you will come back often. If you feel Westminster is a place you would like to live out your discipleship, there will be someone after the service right here at the baptismal font who can answer any questions you may have about the work and ministry of our church. If you'll sign the friendship pad found on the inside aisle, if you'll pass it down and back, we can greet one another by name following the service. There are lots of announcements uh, today after this service in the chapel. There is a service for wholeness and healing. Uh, there's an Easter egg hunt next Saturday. The details are in the window. You will also notice this great photo from last year's Nakomi. Um, it's our all-church retreat. It happens April 13th through the 15th this year. Uh, it rained a lot last year. Rain or shine, we have a great time. Sign-ups are up online, and we hope you'll join us. Also, we have folks leaving from Westminster today to go to Gatlinburg to help that area recover from the fire. Donovan is on that trip with uh, several other wonderful church members who will be doing good work, and we will keep them in our prayers for both travel and their work. We're glad you're here. The Lord be with you. Your word, O oh God, has power to change our lives and to create a whole new world. As we meditate on your word this day, fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may treasure your word with our whole hearts and fix our eyes on you. Amen. Our scripture passage this morning is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. Hear the word of the Lord. Our ears are open. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Says the Lord, I will put my law within them, I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will, I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. <clears throat>
mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And so you are justified when you speak and upright in your judgment. Indeed, I have been wicked from my birth, a sinner from my mother's womb. The sacrifice you Except O God is a humble spirit. For behold, you look for truth deep within me, and will make me understand wisdom secretly. Purge me from my sin, and I shall be pure. Wash me, and I shall be clean in Make me hear of joy and gladness, and the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. The sacrifice you accept, O God, is a saving help again, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. I shall teach your ways to the wicked, and sinners shall return to you. The sacrifice to accept, O God, is a Let us continue to listen for the word of God. Coming to us through the gospel according to John, the 12th chapter, I invite you to please take out your pew Bibles so that we might be able to read together the power of this passage. Page 106, John chapter 12, verses 20 to 33. <coughs> Hear the word of God. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain, but it dies. It bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world 
will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. Oh, good. It's just the fifth Sunday in Lent was uttered by one of my fellow staff members at a recent staff meeting here. Just the fifth, meaning nothing not very out of the ordinary, not Passion Palm Sunday with all of its moving palms and parts and happily moving children. Just the fifth Sunday. Not Holy Week yet with Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday worship bulletins to prepare along with three services on Easter, and please remember to come early to park. Still, the fifth Sunday in Lent is a crucial pivot point before our final journey with Jesus and the disciples to, the, to Jerusalem. Our final journey with them, not only to Jerusalem, but to the cross and to the empty tomb. As Christ followers, telling the story of the weeks and days before Jesus' death is necessary for our own unfolding understanding of the meaning of the life and death of Jesus of Nazareth and the resurrection of Jesus as the Christ. Just as telling the stories of the lives of our loved ones who have died is essential to find meaning and strength for our own ongoing lives. Just so, telling the story of Jesus in preparation for our annual remembrance of his death enables his story to join the fabric of our stories and our grief at bedsides and in kitchens, in cemeteries and columbariums, in pews and in the aloneness of our cars, our grief, our lives, become illuminated by the face of the invisible God in Jesus Christ. Our hope comes from Christ's hope in trusting God, even in his last days. Today, we are confronted with a hard passage. We're confronted with Jesus' parabolic and enigmatic description of the meaning of his own coming death. I confess to you that I have been growing and understanding the cross my whole life long, and I am still growing. For the cross 
has confronted me, and it, it raises questions. Where is God? On the cross? Beyond the cross? At the foot of the cross? I further confess that rather than pause on this fifth Sunday in Lent with its focus, that I just as soon rather get to Easter, to meeting the risen Jesus outside the tomb like Mary did, to call him my Lord and my God, to hear him calling my name as he did hers. I want to meet the risen Lord on the roads of my life like the disciples did, to have my eyes opened and recognize him and to hear him charge me like he did Peter, saying, feed my sheep and fill me with clarity, conviction, and courage as I seek to serve him all my days. Let me ask my questions and share my doubts like Thomas, I wish, and like Thomas, then show me, risen Lord, your wounds. Beholding his suffering is hard. And I found this at the age of 16 when I was exposed to the movie Jesus Christ Superstar. And my tears just flowed and flowed. The creators of the lectionary wanted us, I believe, to be in this hard, wrestling place today. Before we get swept up in the pathos of waving palm branches to the King of Israel next Sunday, rejoicing with those in Jerusalem before the festival of Passover as they lined the streets, mistakenly believing that Jesus would wield power that would defeat the powers of this world with fierce might and thunderous lightning bolt glory. Instead, he speaks of another kind of glory and glorification. And today's passage from John shows that to us. And this passage, moreover, comes after Palm Sunday, sort of out of cycle. But it does so for a reason, because it shows us that the crowds of Jews have already flocked to see Jesus and to see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead, prefiguring the hope of his own resurrection. Today's passage also follows our learning from John that many Jews were already deserting the chief priests and the Pharisees, leaving them in the dust and that orders have already been given to arrest Jesus, to put him to death, and to put the risen Lazarus to death. These orders had already been made, for far too many in Jerusalem were believing in Jesus, the word made flesh, the incarnation of God. Loving God and loving our neighbors as ourselves, loving, serving, and following Jesus as siblings Mary, Martha, and Lazarus did. This can get you in trouble. It can even cost you your life. And so we have to wrestle and taste both anguish and hope on this pivot point day, the fifth Sunday in Lent. And we have to do so ahead of reenacting the triumphal journey into Jerusalem. Belief and faith in Jesus is, my friends, inextricably woven with costly discipleship. And those early Christian writers of the New Testament won't ever let us forget that. My friends, John 12 reminds us that we are part of the worldwide movement from Nashville to the entire world. We are part of the worldwide movement of Jesus followers called to share what has been revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Our passage today interestingly began with some Greeks, Gentiles, not Jews, nor were they converts to Judaism? 
We wish to see Jesus, they say. We want to see him, know him, meet him. They implore Philip, and Philip goes to Andrew, and one becomes two, and the vocation of Christ's disciples to bring others to him. Our vocation was begun. Who was your Philip, your Andrew, your Mary or Martha or Lazarus? Who helped you to see, to know Jesus, to meet him in the heart of your own life? Lent is a time to pause and give thanks for those people and events in our lives that brought us to Jesus, to give thanks for those who helped us to see and experience the good news of God's love and redemption of the world. My third grade Sunday school teacher, Mrs. Winslow, was one of those people for me. She invited me to know Jesus and his love through her love, and she showed me how to trust him as my light. She gave me herself as she showed me Jesus, and she also gave me a little plastic glow-in-the-dark cross, one that I kept by my bedside while I was growing up. And so our passage begins by asking us, might you, might I, might we also be called to be Philip and Andrew and Mary and Martha, Lazarus and Mrs. Winslow for someone else? Jesus, ever clear about God's intentions for his life, knew that his time had come to fulfill God's purposes. The powers of this world that would kill Jesus are already lying in wait for him. The death orders have already been signed. His death is imminent. Instead of leaning into loss or fear, Jesus instead leans into the mystery of new life and new creation through the power of God by sharing with us a parable, a parable of grain. Jesus, ever at work through community, will not remain solitary, a single golden grain, but by falling to the earth and dying, more wheat, more grain will rise up in subsequent generations, he tells us. And God's fruitful harvest will emerge again and again. First, though, Jesus knows that he must die, that his death upon the cross will bring the overcoming of evil and the systems of domination and violence that rule the world. And this will happen through the infinite love of God hanging on a cross. In Christ's death, we live as his first fruits, as we share the fulfillment of God's realm of peace and mercy upon the earth, inaugurated in the cross. As we die with Christ, we live with him. So hear the invitation of Jesus. He invites us to join him to be released from clinging to our lives, to our privilege, to our definitions of success and power and illusions of control. He invites us to say yes to God's transformative power for our lives and for the world. John uses strong language here as Jesus invites us to hate our lives Hate our lives, lives as defined by the oppressive powers of the world that seek to put us in boxes, to squeeze the life out of us, to hate being defined by status and paychecks, by the separation of races and classes and nations, by feelings of guilt and regret and self-doubt and inadequacy, to 
let go of that which holds us down and keeps us back and keeps us from knowing peace. The threat of war, the threat of nuclear warheads. Instead, Jesus invites us to say no to all that and to say yes to our birthright as beloved children of God. To say yes to stepping forth into the bright light of Christ's love and grace and to find our purpose each day as God's children by serving and following him with the gifts of courage and hope that he gives to us. He invites us to say yes all the way to the cross. The Shentrup family lost their daughter Carmen in the massacre at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. I happened to hear their story on NPR this past week. Perhaps you did too. They said after being silent, they felt that they had to tell the story of their tragic loss, that they just needed to believe that somehow, some way, some day, Carmen's death would have meaning in spite of this horrific tragedy. Their hopes for Carmen were not unlike the ones I hold for my children, Julia and Adam, and I found myself identifying with these grief-stricken parents. They shared how Carmen had skipped a grade earlier and was just turning 17 in her senior year and was so excited about graduating and going on to college. She was taking six AP advanced placement courses this year. She played not just one but three instruments and she hoped to become a medical researcher and to bring hope to people who are hurting. She had an older brother in college and a younger sister in that same high school. Her mother, an elementary school principal, said as she choked back tears, I shouldn't have to be grateful that one of my children came home safe from school. You see, the gunman with his semi-automatic weapon and high-power magazine had shut out the window in the locked door of Carmen's classroom and had sprayed the class with gunfire. Five or six bullets hit Carmen, and her family was not allowed to see her for 12 days until the medical examiner was assured he had done enough work on her. Her father, a health technology executive, spoke of one extended family member who said, sorry about your daughter, we can't imagine it, but it's our Second Amendment right. Imagine it was your daughter, the father erupted, and then he told the story of another extended family member who had shared with them that they themselves had an assault rifle in their home and that because of what happened, they were now getting rid of it. This fifth Sunday in Lent asks the church, what sense can be made of death? Awful, unjust, undeserved death. John later tells us in his gospel, Christ showed the disciples his hands and his feet. Christ crucified and risen met the disciples in the upper room and on the road, and he sent them forth to follow and serve. And so as we get ready on this fifth Sunday for the journey to Jerusalem, to the upper room, to Golgotha, and to the joy of the empty tomb, we begin once again by grappling with the meaning of Christ's cross. We prepare ourselves on this fifth Sunday in Lent for what is about to come. We know the story, but we've got to be here where we are now to live the story. 
and in the process, we connect to the losses of loved ones dear in our own lives. We tell their stories, and we tell Jesus' story. Through the telling, meaning and faith evolves in the center of our hearts and lives over the course of our lives, and our strength is renewed. I do not know what is ahead, a member in hospice care once said to me. It is unknown, but I have faith that in God's arms all will be well, and I will be at peace. For the memory and the mystery that created us will sustain us. So tell the story of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In the story, you will find yourself. In the story, you will become part of Christ's abundant, joyous harvest. Believe the good news of the gospel. The grain that fell to earth and died bears fruit to all generations. We are fed by the living word. Thanks be to God. Amen.
us say what we believe. We believe in God, whose love is the source of all life and the desire of our lives, whose love was given a human face in Jesus of Nazareth, whose love was crucified by the evil that waits to enslave us all, and whose love, defeating even death, is our glorious promise of freedom. Therefore, though we are sometimes fearful and full of doubt, in God we trust. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we commit ourselves in the service of others to seek justice and to live in peace, to care for the earth, and to share the commonwealth of God's goodness, to live in the freedom of forgiveness and the power of the spirit of love, and in the company of the faithful and the risen Christ, so to be the church for the glory of God and the redemption of the world. Amen. Lord be with you. Lift up our hearts. O God, gather us now to be with you as you are with us. Soothe our tiredness, quiet our fretfulness, curb our aimlessness, relieve our compulsiveness. Let us be easy for a moment. O oh Lord, release us from our fears and guilt which grip us so tightly, and from the expectations and opinions which we so tightly grip, that we may be open to receiving what you give, to risking something genuinely new, to learning something refreshingly different. O oh God, gather us to be with you as you are with us. Deepen our wounds into wisdom, Shape our weakness into compassion. Gentle our envy into enjoyment, our fear into trust, and our guilt into honesty. As always, O oh God, we pray for peace in war-torn places around the globe, and we pray for those working for it. We pray for the ill and those who tend them. We pray for the lonely and for those who befriend them. We pray for the frightened and for those who encourage them. And we pray for the glad of heart and for those who laugh with them. Give grace to us all, O God, we pray in Jesus Christ. Amen. With grateful hearts, let us bring the fruits of our labors to the Lord. Let us receive our offering.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Most giving and forgiving God, you provide for our every need. You open our lips to offer you praise. You strengthen our hands to respond to Christ's call. With hearts, hands, and voices renewed by your spirit, we place now before you our commitment to serve. Use us in ways that will benefit others and accept what we offer as a sign of our faith. Following Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Lord, help us to live in faith and through him to pray. Remembering Jesus, in whom we grow strong, he sends us forth now. For you who serve with him, he says, you follow me, and whoever follows me is my servant also, that where I am, 
you also will be. So let us go forth in the love of Jesus Christ, and may we serve the world in courage and faith and hope, knowing that we are held in the saving grace of Christ, that we are ever uplifted in the everlasting love of God, and that we are sent forth in the infinite power of the Holy Spirit, now and evermore. <laughs>